Calaroga Shark Media. Hello, I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. Congratulations, Bo Burnham making history on the Billboard charts. The soundtrack album to his Netflix comedy special, Bo Burnham Inside, has spent a record-breaking 122nd non-consecutive week at number one on Billboard's comedy album charts. Those charts don't move around a lot. It's not like the music charts. You'll see things stay a really long time. The comedy charts started in 2004, the most weeks at number one on Billboard's comedy albums chart. Bo Burnham at 122 passes Little Dickie's professional rapper at 121, then a gap to Dane Cook's Retaliation with 49, Weird Al's Mandatory Fun at 34, Lonely Island's Turtleneck and Chain at 34. That was a huge album that year. Flight of the Concords at 23 weeks, Lonely Island's Incredibad, 22. Actually, I thought Incredibad was the more popular one than Turtleneck and Chain. Hmm, my memory's getting fuzzy. Dane Cook's Rough Around the Edges was up there for 22 weeks, Weird Al's Straight Out of Linwood for 22, and... Wait, what is this? The Bob's Burgers music album soundtrack was number one for 20 weeks? Now, let me ask you a couple questions here if you're a new listener, right? Regular listeners know the two questions I'm going to ask. But if you're new, let me ask you a couple questions here. First question. Have you ever seen Bob's Burgers? You haven't. I know you haven't. Nobody has. This thing has supposedly been around for 15 years, and apparently there was a soundtrack of the show. I believe the soundtrack exists. I believe merch exists. I've definitely seen the merch. I've definitely seen the promos for the show. But have you ever actually seen this show? Like, have you been home and you're sitting in front of a screen of some sort and Bob's Burgers actually comes on? I don't think you have. Second question, and this one is the really weird one. Have you ever met anyone, anyone at all, who has seen Bob's Burgers? You haven't. Now, isn't that weird for a show that's been on for 15 years? The Bob's Burgers music album, 20 weeks on the charts. Bo Burnham has been at the top. Every now and then he gets kicked off for those weeks. He got kicked off by, and this will totally show you how the comedy charts work. The Monster Mash. Yeah, the one from 1962. Annually, that charts in October. Another thing that kicked it out of the number one spot. Mouse Rats, the awesome album. The band led by Chris Pratt's character Andy Dwyer from Parks and Rec. That kicked it in November of 21. And Steel Panthers on the Prowl kicked it in March of 23. The album became Bo Burnham's fourth number one album on the Comedy Albums chart. The only other artist with four or more number ones, I'll remind you, this only started in, what I say, 2004, so you're not going to hear George Carlin, Richard Pryor here. Uh, but Larry the Cable Guy has seven. Steel Panther, if you don't know what that is, uh, parody metal band. Picture Van Halen, but comedy, that, uh, seven. Jim Gaffigan with six. Weird Al with five. Nephew Tommy with five, The Lonely Island with five, Dane Cook with four, Doug Stanhope with four, Flight of the Concords with four, and Patton Oswalt with four. I'm unfamiliar with Nephew Tommy. Uh, apparently, he co-hosts the Steve Harvey Morning Show, where he makes prank phone calls. Some of you are screaming at your podcast right now. I don't know. I do this every day. Never saw his name before. You can be mad at me. It's okay. Nate Bergazzi is still talking about his October 19th appearance at the Hartman Arena. Why? He shared a video. The video starts with Nate Bergazzi walking through Hartman Arena and mentioning he's going to do a sound check and go for a run. Then it cuts to him flopped in a chair with a hoodie on his head, not looking nearly as perky as he previously did. Nate says, well, I think the lesson we've learned here, running is bad. Bergazzi describes how his hands and feet started itching and he felt his lips swelling. Kansas allergies, most likely due to ragweed, had hit him hard. Next, he starts talking to some dude who supposedly was a doctor. Nate says, we don't know who this guy is. He talks a great game, though. Well, it turns out it was Sean Wadsworth, who's a physician with Atlas MD. Wadsworth was home getting ready to go to the show for fun, and he got a call that somebody needed help. Bergazzi said he resisted taking Benadryl because it would make him sleepy, but that's what Wadsworth suggested over the phone. Wadsworth said he didn't know who he was helping till he showed up and was shocked to find out it was Nate. He had put some other medicine in his pockets as he walked out the door. Nate made fun of him, saying he brings all his medicine in his pocket. Dr. Sean. Guess he's legit. A lot of people watching Mike Birbiglia's Old Man and the Pool on Netflix this weekend. Birbigs was on the Last Laugh podcast. Mike said, it's weird. Sometimes with these shows, they get so personal. I'll be on stage thinking, am I saying this to strangers? What am I doing? It's almost like I sometimes become the people who are criticizing me in my personal life who are like, what are you doing? And I'm on stage and I'm thinking, yeah, what am I doing? He talked about anxiety and journaling. Birbig said, when I was in high school and a lot of college in my 20s, I had a lot of anxiety. I'd have this shortness of breath. I talk about it a little bit in the show where I feel like I can't catch my breath. Through the years, starting in my 20s, I started to see a therapist. And then at a certain point, I started to write it in a journal. 
And that was when I made that observation. When I started writing in a journal, I felt like, oh, wow, I actually do feel better afterwards. And now I always recommend it to people because I'm like, it's the least expensive form of therapy, writing in a journal. Write down what you're the saddest about, angriest about, feel most strongly about, because more often than not, you start to go, oh, actually, it's not so bad. I'm furious about this. I'm angry about this. In the grand scheme of things, not too bad. Mike also talked about aging, and he said, one of my favorite comics, Taylor Thomas, had came on my podcast, and she says, my sister and I used to watch you when we were in middle school. And she's a fully realized, fantastic comedian. The idea of middle school, that's a long ago, right? But in some ways, I feel like I have a foot in both universes. I'm at the comedy cellar quite a bit, working out jokes, and I cross paths with a lot of people in their 20s who I feel a kinship with. And then I cross paths with people like Chris Rock and Colin Quinn, who I feel like I have a certain kinship with too. I don't feel like I'm in one camp or the other. I just feel like I'm somewhere in the middle of those two things. Amen, Burt Biggs. Uh, I, my brain is young, and you know, I, I recently did the race and then my body reminded me that I'm 54. I feel ya. Adam Sandler spoke to IndieWire, gave some details about his reunion with the Safdie brothers. The Safdie brothers are the creative forces behind the best, actually good, Adam Sandler movie, Uncut Gems. Uncut Gems is a fantastic film. If you listen every day, you know I'm not the biggest Adam Sandler fan. But Uncut Gems is solid and clearly the best of the Adam Sandler films. The Safdie brothers are working with Adam Sandler on untitled Netflix film, it has something to do with baseball, Sandler said. We're not sure right now. We kind of missed the opportunity of baseball season because of the strike. A lot of it was going to be shot during live baseball, so it's going to take a minute. We're figuring it out right now. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. Sandler has previously teased that the script was insane and originally 340 pages. They've been writing this movie we're supposed to do together for a couple of years. They just write hundreds and hundreds of pages. I'll read them and say, I like the part when this, and they'll be like, oh, that's not in it anymore. We did a whole other thing. We're going to send you a new draft. They just don't stop writing and thinking, coming at every angle they can. And this movie we're going to do is pretty amazing. John Lovitz doesn't like all this political comedy on your late night shows. Lovitz was talking to Fox and said, I don't like it. They were comedy shows. And now, except for Jimmy Fallon, they've all become very political. And for me, it's too much. I mean, Johnny Carson would, you know, he would do two or three jokes about whoever was president and what was going on. And that was it. But they were entertainment shows. I know all these guys, and they're very nice guys, very talented. I know Seth, I know Stephen Colbert, I know Jimmy Kimmel. I think they're funny, you know? And then they started doing the political stuff. It's like, so one-sided. And it's like, it's this whole thing. It's just like, it's not the shows that I used to go on. You know, it was The Tonight Show and David Letterman. It's their show. They can do whatever they want. But if you're asking me, do I like it? I'm like, no. If I want the news, I'll watch the news. I'm not watching those shows. They're late night entertainment, but it's all political, except for Jimmy Fallon. They keep getting mad at Jimmy. Why are you going to politics? Because he's doing a silly, like, escapism entertainment show. They just hammer it to death, and they become, here's my political agenda. They're very open about it. And I'm like, well, all right, I have no say in that. It's their show, you know, but I don't particularly like that they've become that, because that's where the comedians and the stand-up and the bits, you know, like Letterman, who's comedy. <laughs> the Guardian asked Eliza Schlesinger what her current show Hard Feelings is about, and she said, up top, I use my experience going to a bizarre strip club as a lens to examine how little women actually have to do in reality to turn men on. It's a fast-paced, super energetic, poignant, at a times whimsical social commentary on BS standards, cancel culture, freedom of speech, plastic surgery, pumpkin spice lattes, and my red-hot take on Gen Z versus millennials. Eliza touring while pregnant. She said, I don't think about it much. A body in motion stays in motion. So I get out into the city, never miss my one allowed cup of coffee, try to target one or two cultural things, eat as many local snacks as I can before the heartburn catches up, but do workouts when available, and I always allow myself time to rest. What else would she like to try in the future? Eliza said, what people don't see are all the projects that fail or are forever in limbo. Basically, it takes an act of God to get a movie or a TV show made. Like any hardworking artist in entertainment, I'm always writing a screenplay, a pilot, shooting something, pitching something, or meeting with someone. I'd like to have a movie or a TV show come to fruition in 24. It'd be great to get a series on the air, be able to create a universe, and have more than a season with it. All I ever want is for my ideas to see the light of day in a meaningful way. Leanne Morgan spoke to Forbes about when she was starting out, and she said, well, Brian at Zanies in Nashville told me, Leanne, you've got three babies. This is going to be very hard for you to do, because I wanted to do comedy clubs. I did a few clubs every year, but I just tried to get anywhere on stage that I could, but raised my children, number one. So if you needed someone for a fundraiser, I was your fundraiser girl, or the Rotary Club. Then I got a tour early on with Karen Mills called the Southern Fried Chicks. I was really the opener, and that was 2004. That was really kind of like my comedy club. I really developed my first 45 minutes on that tour. We did about 50 dates a year. It was on the weekend, so I didn't have to have a babysitter. I was always working. It just wasn't always the traditional path. Westward spoke to Jay Farrow, who said, It's a blessing to have the SNL name on my resume. After you're in an institution like that, all the other jobs aren't as hard. That one is so mentally and physically demanding that everything else is a cakewalk. I got to be there at what time? 11 a.m.? And I'm done at 5? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> 
<laughs> at SNL, the writing happens late at night. For example, on Tuesdays, I'd be there from 2 p.m. till about 11 a.m. the next morning. It's a grind, man. But grind makes diamonds. If you can get there and make something for yourself, then you're set. I mean, look at Pete Davidson. He's in like 20 commercials right now. And that is your comedy news for today. You can follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Overcast Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow.